The topic for discussion is transmissible viral infections. You know, we have uh, lots and lots of transmissible viral infections, you know, from simple flu, which can actually spread through droplet, to, you know, the uh, dreadful HIV, AIDS. There are more, many number of transmissible viral infections. And the various modes of transmission, the most common route of transmission is sexual route and also through blood transfusion, okay? And other modes of transmission could be by direct contact, uh, such as droplet infection or directly touching the wound, the, uh, there is exchange of serous material uh, and pre, uh, you have this vertical transmission from mother to child. So various, various modes of transmission are present and the viral organisms or the viral agents which are usually transmissible are the most common HIV uh, is that is you know your human immunodeficiency virus we have hepatitis virus this is again uh, more predominantly seen viral infection which is caused as a transmissible viral infection hepatitis B and C and infections like uh, cytomegaloviral infection especially herpangina and uh, we have this uh, uh, um, HTLV virus which is again human T lymphocytic virus Epstein-Barr virus, which is a common cause for nasopharyngeal carcinoma, glandular disease or Kissing's disease. We have Epstein-Barr virus is also one of the transmissible infection. Human parvovirus B19 is also one of the transmissible viral infection. But the most common viral infections which we actually encounter, which are transmissible, one is influenza, that is flu virus, where common cold is present. When patient sneezes, the droplets will fall into an unaffected person, which can you know, uh, get, get transmitted through droplet. And one most commonly encountered in dental offices is human herpes virus, especially the HSV-1. HSV-1 uh, usually can spread through direct con contact or also HSV-2 can actually be transmitted through unsafe sexual practices. This HSV, I mean the human herpes uh, virus, especially the herpes simplex virus, uh, <clears throat> usually the lesions are vesicular type of lesions which actually are fluid filled and epitheliotrophic virus. When they actually break down, they, the, this fluid uh, or the direct contact with the lesion can also lead to you know, uh, you know, transmission of the herpes simplex or herpes, so human herpes virus. Now, though we have so many number of uh, viruses which are transmissible, the major, you know, the focus is on two major infections of viral transmissible infections. The first one is HIV AIDS, that is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And the second one is hepatitis. Why? Because the HIV AIDS has no cure. I mean, we don't have something like complete cure to, for the patient. We only are capable to increase the CD4 level uh, of the patient. Thus, we are, you know, increasing the quality of life or say the lifespan of the patient but there is nothing like complete cure for HIV 8 till day and then other important one is hepatitis B and C why it is more focused because these are the conditions which are more frequently encountered in a dental office and they can be transmitted by single needle stick injury also hence understanding about hepatitis B and C is also important as a dental surgeon so we will be focusing on AIDS and also on the HIV virus and also on the hepatitis B in this uh, lecture of various transmissible diseases. Now coming to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome that is AIDS. HIV AIDS is uh, you know one of the uh, global panic actually it has been uh, you know uh, from the time of its you know, first discovery in 1981. Uh, later, it was 1982, it was the HIV virus itself was identified and later CDC, the Center for Disease Control has named or given this condition as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Why immunodeficiency? Because the HIV virus which is the causative for this AIDS actually goes and attacks CD4 T lymphocytes. That is the reason it is also called as lymphotrophic virus, T lymphotrophic virus because it resides within the T lymphocytes. Okay, as it resides there, it... it as we all know, lymphocytes are the ones that are responsible for the immunity. They are responsible for fighting back against the infections. So, because of this uh, virus, it is actually, you know, uh, leading to immune deficiency. Thus, it is an acquired condition. Hence, it is an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. There are actually two types of HIV virus which are responsible for uh, causing uh, HIV AIDS, which are HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is actually a pandemic one which, can, which we come across across the globe whereas HIV-2 is you know very much endemic to sub-African, sub-Saharan and African areas okay it is like more endemic to African region but 
this hiv virus is actually known to be inherited from uh, you know uh, simian immunodeficiency virus and this simian immunodeficiency virus are again of two types siv1 and siv2 siv1 is seen in chimpanzees whereas siv2 in suti mangabe virus and coming back coming back to the about the virus it is actually an rna virus belonging to lentivirus family of retroviruses subfamily of let retroviruses as i told you it is a t lymphocytic virus and hence aids is also called as idiopathic cd4 t lymphocytopenia hiv1 is a worldwide pandemic whereas hiv2 as i told you is occurs it rarely occurs outside the africa that means it is present completely within africa so this is about the structure of uh, hiv virus hiv virus we have uh, an envelope is present and two rna single stranded rnas are present it has in the characteristic enzyme called as reverse transcriptase and envelope is present and we have certain uh, uh, glycoprotein complexes and also we have uh, nucleocapsid and capsid and certain viral rna genomes are present and uh, this uh, glycoprotein capsid especially the glycoxylation gp120 and gp41 are characteristic proteins that are you know seen on the envelope of this uh, hiv virus now coming back to its modes of transmission this hiv virus uh, predominantly the mode of transmission is through sexual route where unsafe sexual practices are been uh, uh, you know uh, performed or in case of homosexuals also it is most commonly seen parenteral route the most common one is through blood transfusion that which was unchecked for uh, you know uh, the pre uh, you know we, we will not screen proper screening is not done in those cases there can be uh, you know transmission uh, through blood transfusion and also in case of you know drug abuse and using a unsafe syringe in drug abuse what happens a same syringe and needle have been transferred from one pay, one uh, you know drug uh, uh, user to another drug user which can also lead to this parenteral route of transmission of hiv aids and vertical and perinatal route especially if the mother is hiv positive and uh, you know if a proper medication is not being taken and the child can also be infected through this vertical transmission and also sometimes through breastfeeding also this can happen and organ transplantation if unchecked or if the proper proper screening is done from an uh, uh, you know hiv positive person to a negative person in those cases also hiv can be transmitted and in case of artificial insemination and in case of occupational exposures occupational exposure most commonly seen in health workers where like doctors nurses physicians etc where there could be an occupational accidental exposure by needle prick injury or by direct contact from blood to blood and most commonly this has been encountered in case of obstetrics and gynecology practice in those practice this is been more commonly encountered in dental offices this is very rare but all precautions has to be taken whenever you are treating a hiv positive patient all universal precautions has to be taken to prevent this accidental occupational exposure now coming to the clinical picture of how this hiv aids is present usually this hiv aids follows a latent period of about 8 to 12 weeks of time this latent period is after the you know inoculation by the virus there will be uh, until the antibodies are present this latent period is taken uh, will be present and during this latent period there will be intense viremia there will be rapid multiplication of the virus and which will be later followed by a zero conversion in this phase we have something like the uh, the hiv infection is been divided into various types uh, you know in this time frame the first one is acute infection period or acute retroviral syndrome this occurs immediately after there yeah, there is a you know inoculation with hiv virus in this stage what happens is it is usually last about 1 to 2 weeks period of time here there will be intense increased multiplication of the virus and thus increased viremia in response to this increased viremia the immunological response what happens the body produces various types of clinical symptoms and signs which include patient will have fever patient will have myalgia there can be fleeting arthralgia patient can uh, land up into lymphadenopathy patient will have diarrhea there can be other you know uh, inflammatory signs associated in this case of acute retroviral syndrome in this period what happens is there are no antibodies are present Uh, you know it antibodies are not been present in this phase of acute retroviral syndrome because of there are no antibodies in this stage whenever a patient is been tested for 
antibodies for HIV AIDS, this case might show negative. But remember, in acute infection period or acute retroviral syndrome uh, period, patient is still infectious. There can be transmission of HIV virus, though the antibodies are not, you know, uh, uh, uprooted within the circulation. The next stage is carrier stage or clinical latency. Carrier stage or clinical latency stage is actually a stage of asymptomatic stage. There is risk of infection even in the state of this carrier state or clinical latency. In this stage, there is something called as progressive generalized lymphadenopathy. There will be multiple lymph nodes palpable, especially in the uh, cervical and axillary lymph nodes are more commonly palpable. And then the next end stage of HIV infection is AIDS, which is also called as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Here, many opportunistic infections and other AIDS defining conditions pop up. And this is the stage actually, which has been, you know, the severity of AIDS is being defined by the viral load and also by the CD4 count. Lesser the CD4 count, greater is the severity of the disease. Greater is the viral load, greater is the severity of disease. Sometimes the severity would be so high, the viral pyremia could be more than 1 lakh copies. The CD4 count would be so less, less than 200 CD4 uh, count can also be seen in these cases of HIV AIDS. And in AIDS, there will be multitude of organs and organ systems will be involved. Coming to AIDS defining conditions and uh, we have the main symptoms of AIDS. The central symptoms patient will have encephalitis, there can be meningitis, there can be retinitis of the eye and lungs are the most common organs that are being involved in HIV AIDS. Patient can have pneumocystis, patient can have pneumonia, patient can have tuberculosis, okay. Multiple organ involvement can be seen, there can be hepalobatomy, there can be you know different types of uh, uh, different organs, visceral organs might be involved in this tuberculosis. Liver can be involved, biliary tuberculosis, lungs can also be involved, even the bone can also be involved in these cases. And we can also see various tumors like Kaposi's sarcoma etc. And skin tumors can also be seen in these cases. And gastrointestinal symptoms like esophagitis can be seen. Patient can also, uh, you know, manifest with uh, chronic diarrhea and also certain gastrointestinal tumors. Now coming back to the oral manifestations of HIV, we have various oral manifestations of HIV. Sometimes the oropharyngeal candidiasis itself can be the first symptom that can, that is manifestation of this HIV. And necrotizing gingivitis can be seen, necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis can be seen where a crater or punched out lesions can be seen on the gingiva. Patient will have halitosis, gingival erythema, ulcers on the gingiva and you know periodontitis can be seen in these cases. There will be loosening of teeth. Hairy leukoplakia is one of the common uh, common finding or common oral manifestation of HIV AIDS. Hairy leukoplakia especially on the lateral border of the tongue where we can see slight wrinkled appearance. And then angular stomatitis, oral warts. Oral warts however are not so commonly encountered but uh, they, can be as, uh, encounter, they can be seen as oral manifestations. Aphthous ulcers and Kaposi sarcoma especially involving the gingiva or the palate can be seen. This is a picture which is actually showing us oropharyngeal candidiasis and in this picture we can see Kaposi sarcoma involving the gingiva. Coming to the diagnosis of HIV AIDS, we have, you know, the diagnosis could be through thorough history, asking about any accidental, uh, you know, blood transfusion or accidental needle prick injury or previous history of blood transfusion or patients unsafe sexual practices, etc. Clinical features and the clinical features, mostly the AIDS defining conditions which we see can help us in identifying, you know, we can actually go ahead with the uh, WHO case definition for AIDS surveillance. In those cases, by, by, by that staging also, we can actually identify points which uh, uh, stage the patient is and CDC revised surveillance case definition criteria can also be used. What is the CDC revised surveillance uh, definition criteria for AIDS in 2008? It was given and it, it uh, divides you know, the severity of disease into three stages. One is stage one, stage two and stage three. In stage one, there could be, they have, patient should be confirmed through in laboratory for HIV infection and the CD4 T lymphocyte count should be greater than 500 microliter per microliter and also the CD4 percentage should be greater than 29 percent. In this case, we clinical evidence need not be present. That means there, there cannot, there need not be any AIDS defining conditions present. In stage two, uh, again, laboratory confirmation is required and here the CD4 count could be between somewhere between 200 to 499 per microliter. That means the CD4 
percentage should be around 14 to 28 percent and in this stage 2 also the clinical evidence is not required whereas in stage 3 it requires both clinical evidence and laboratory evidence the laboratory evidence here the cd4 count would be somewhere less than uh, 200 per microliter whereas the percentage could be again less than 14 percent and in the clinical evidence we should have some or the other documentation of this AIDS defining conditions and coming to lab investigations ELISA test which is nothing but enzyme linked immunosorbent assay as a screening test once ELISA test is positive then we can go ahead with western blot test but remember all negative cases on ELISA need not be completely HIV negative cases as I already told you if patient is an acute retroviral syndrome phase patient will show negative because ELISA test and western blot test check for antibodies and not the virus or it will not check for the antigen so the fourth generation tests have been present where it actually checks for the antigens that is a pre p24 antigen and hence even in the acute uh, syndromic stage acute retroviral syndrome stage also we can know whether the patient is uh, you know HIV positive or HIV negative and absolute CD4 count and CD4 percentage this will help us to know in which stage the patient is uh, according to the CDC surveillance and HIV viral loads of copies as I already told you the severity of AIDS is defined by the decreased CD4 count and increased viral copy load right so HIV viral copy load is also required and we have point of care or rapid test where we can directly check for HIV as a CHSI investigation or more like a rapid screening investigation can we check both in blood serum or in uh, saliva and the tests which are uh, you know some of the examples of this point of care or rapid test are ORA sure ORA quick etc are point of care test and there are certain virus linked tests which are nothing but PCR PCR actually gives us a good uh, insight it is actually a a gold standard one again and we have p24 antigen detection test and also the viral culture and complete blood count will actually help us in uh, knowing the amount of lymphocytes which are present whether because in this we have decreased lymphocytes right so complete blood count will also help us in knowing the wbc count now coming to the management when we are actually manage trying to manage this hiv aids our target is on two one is directly hiv itself and second is treating the opportunistic infections because if HIV infection is potentially fatal, it is not potentially fatal just because of the infection but it can be potentially fatal because of the secondary opportunistic infections that the virus is causing. So our management will be on both. One is treating the HIV infection directly and second one is treating the other opportunistic infections that are associated with HIV AIDS. The antiretroviral therapy that is the ART is actually based upon the CD4 count. We actually initiate ART only when the CD4 count is almost less than 350 cells per microliter and when the viral load is greater than 55,000 copies per microliter. If any one of them is increased also, we can actually start with this antiretroviral therapy. And the antiretroviral drugs, we have you know, classification of drugs. We have fusion inhibitors like enfuberitidine. We have nucleoside reverse transcriptase uh, inhibitors like zidovudine, stavudine, etc. We have non-nucleosidic reverse transcriptase inhibitors like ravirapine and delaviridine. And we have protease inhibitors like indinavir and brutinavir. Nowadays, what happens is because there is increased resistance to at least one type of drug, we are going ahead with highly active antiretroviral therapy. What is this highly active antiretroviral therapy? Here we are actually forming a regimen where combination of drugs is given, especially indicated in case of acute HIV infection in adolescent patients and patients who are having co-infections or comorbidities. So how do we make this regimen? Any three NRTIs or two NRTIs with one NNRTI, two NRTIs with one PI. NRTIs are nothing but nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. NNRTIs are nothing but non-nucleotide reverse, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And PI is nothing but uh, your protease inhibitors. Apart from this highly, retro, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy, before going into cure, prevention is always better. So preventive measures that has to be taken are, uh, you know, follow safe sexual practices. Before blood transfusion, check for donor, I mean screening for donor blood has to be done, completely has to be done even in organ transplantation or artificial insemination and in cases of uh, drug abuse, uh, you know, avoid using, you know, the syringes etc. Always use 
you know aseptic conditions when we are doing any surgical procedure and next one is there is increased risk of occupational exposure so in those cases always always follow universal protocol universal precautions wearing double mouth mask double gloves eyewear and you know this will actually an apron or gown will actually help you in preventing or cross contamination of this hiv virus from a positive percent to negative one and coming to next another transmissible infection and this transmissible infection is again of syphilis syphilis is again uh, you know uh, one of the transmissible infection which is most commonly encountered one syphilis is actually a contagious disease of systemic uh, disease which is a venereal infection or a sexually transmitted disease it is std caused by spirochetes called as trypanema pallida and it is not a viral infection remember it is caused by a spirochete called as trypanema pallida and it is usually contracted through or it is usually transmitted through sexual contact or through vertical transmission that is uh, it could be acquired or congenital also again and this uh, syphilis has again four main clinical stages it is again uh, divided into primary syphilis secondary syphilis tertiary and quaternary syphilis we have other types of syphilis like latent syphilis and congenital syphilis coming to this primary syphilis the most common sites of primary syphilis are genitalia the groin and axilla and we in this primary syphilis we have a characteristic feature of regional lymphadenopathy and it is usually painless okay painless regional lymphadenopathy is present and they have a characteristic lesion called as chancres these chancres are nothing but they are firm painless injurated lesion injurated uh, papular lesion which is usually erythematous in nature okay and these chancres are highly contagious these chancres are usually present in the on uh, the penis region and also in the oral cavity also the oral manifestations is 60% of these patients can have the chancres on the lip also on the tongue gingiva and the tonsillar area it is slightly painful when it is occurring on the oral mucosa oral uh, region it is slightly painful and large lymph nodes can be seen associated with this uh, particular region in primary syphilis patient will have will manifest with fever there can be a symmetrical rash can also be seen multiple macular uh, no symmetric rashes maculopapular rash can also be seen in this cases when primary syphilis now coming to secondary syphilis secondary syphilis is actually uh, you know we characterized by skin mucosal and uh, uh, you know skin mucosal maculopapular and nodular lesions and uh, lymphadenopathy is commonly seen in these cases we have a characteristic mucous patches even the primary syphilis is contagious okay and in the secondary syphilis also this mucous patches are the one which are highly contagious by just touching direct contact itself another patient can get uh, you know through this mucous patches mucous patches are uh, nothing but they are painless oral uh, crescent shaped ulcers which are present in the oral mucosa when these mucous patches they coalesce they actually form certain lesions called as snail track lesions or serpanginous lesions why they are called snail track or serpanginous it is because of their shape you know they appear like a snail track lesions hence the name is snail track or serpanginous lesions and another characteristic lesion called as condyloma lata this condyloma lata is nothing but a tumor uh, condyloma lata is nothing but a lesion which has a broad base you know it is like slightly elevated where you see form plaque type lesion and patient will also have various clinical manifestations like sore throat fever headache they'll have generalized lymphadenopathy and also meningismus is one of the common condition which has been commonly encountered in this condition we have certain other oral manifestations like mucus patches and so snail track ulcers hoarseness of voice this is because of uh, lesions which is present within the larynx and pharynx and we have maculopapular rash which is confined to palate and the next stage is tertiary syphilis tertiary syphilis also called as late syphilis or gamata uh, syphilis stage here the characteristic lesion is present called as gamma this gamma is nothing but a chronic granulomatous uh, lesion with central necrosis this gamma can be either of cutaneous type or mucosal type in cutaneous gamma it is nothing but a granulomatous lesion with again central necrosis and in mucosal gamma usually present within the oral mucosa and hard palate this mucosal gamma can lead to perforation of the palate also and intraosseous gammas are also present and these gammas are usually caused because of end and arteritis obliterans and we have a condition again a final stage called as late stage or quaternary syphilis in this later uh, later stage or quaternary syphilis we can see various 
Clinical symptoms such as bone pain during nights, we have uh, osteoperiostitis of long bones also called as sabret tibia and this late or quaternary phase of syphilis has various manifestations of cardiovascular and also of the neurovascular symptoms. Cardiovascular symptoms usually is when it affects the iota and neurovascular syphilis also called as neurosyphilis it actually leads to meningitis etc. And uh, there is a condition called as hyperlobatum. Hyperlobatum is where multiple gamma are seen on the liver. And neurosyphilis is a condition where meningovascular syphilis, paretic syphilis and tapes dorsalis can be seen. You also can see uveitis and atrophy, uh, optic atrophy and chorioretinitis can also be seen in these cases of late or quaternary syphilis. And then we have something called as congenital syphilis. This congenital syphilis usually manifests as early congenital syphilis, late in or late uh, infections. And we have certain uh, uh, feature called as regates. Regates are nothing but you know we have vertical fissures that are present around the mouth. In later period of time this can cause decreased mouth opening. And then in latent syphilis usually it is asymptomatic. Patients usually will not have any symptoms but still patient in case of latent syphilis is uh, you know uh, has that ability to uh, transmit the disease. It is it's still infectious. What I mean is in latent syphilis also patient is still infectious. We have this latent syphilis again based upon time it is divided into two types. Early latent syphilis where it is less than two years of age and late latent syphilis where it is greater than two years of age. Two years time period. Coming to the diagnosis we have uh, various Diagnostic techniques to identify the syphilitic uh, organism. One is immunofluorescent staining can be done. Dark field microscopy or phase contrast illumination. Because of uh, highly motile nature of this treponema pallida, we use this dark field microscopy. And various serological tests are present which are non-specific and specific type. In non-specific type we have lipoidal or cardiolipin antigenic tests which includes BDRL and rapid plasma regain re um, test. And we have specific antitriponemal tests like FTA-ABS test, FTA-ABS IgM test and we have triponema pallidum heme agglutination uh, TPHA that is and we have enzyme uh, immunoassay test that is CAPTIA, IgG and IgM. The mainstay of treatment for this is penicillin G and uh, in primary or secondary syphilis we can actually go ahead with 2.4 million units of uh, uh, you know intramuscular penicillin G. If patient is allergic to penicillin then in those cases we can actually go with tetracycline or doxycycline okay and in latent or tertiary syphilis also we can go with penicillin G, benzate. 2.4 million units IM weekly we can go for 3 weeks period of time. Again, if patient is allergic to penicillin, go ahead with tetracycline or doxycycline. The pediatric dose is should not be more than 5,000, 50,000 units per kg. Uh, that is uh, IM. It can be given weekly once for about three weeks period of time. So these are, you know, the most commonly encountered uh, 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 transmissible infections. The transmissible viral one, we have seen HIV AIDS. And also the transmissible spirogetal one, we have seen syphilis. We have other transmissible uh, viral infections that is hepatitis B and C usually they are transmitted through blood transfusion and also through uh, you know uh, any through blood transfusion is a first important rule and we in this uh, big uh, hepatitis other than hepatitis we also have uh, as we have discussed HSV I have to discuss about the uh, human uh, 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 herpes simplex virus and then we have cytomegalovirus so these are various kinds of uh, transmissible infections even in viral and also in spirochetal uh, uh, organisms okay so this is about uh, various transmissible infections that we actually encountered in our routine practices thank you